Sometimes, actors should just leave their clothes on. Nude scenes in cinema range from exciting to downright awful, and we've compiled the worst of the worst. Apologies to Halle Berry and Howard the Duck, because these revealing moments seriously dragged their movies down. Nobody ever expected the Harold and Kumar movies to be highbrow cinema, but it's safe to say that some fans hoped that 2008's Harold and Kumar Escape from Guantanamo Bay would offer some amusing social commentary. With a title as lengthy and descriptive as that, how could the movie not lampoon America's post-9-11 policy? Unfortunately, Cal Penn and John Cho spend barely 10 minutes inside the infamous prison for terrorists before escaping and reverting back to the world of meandering stoner comedy. No one has anything smart or even interesting to say about race or politics. Not even a fake George W. Bush has much to say other than smoking pot is fun. Dude, this is weed. <laughs> That's Alabama Kush. That's only the finest. The film hits rock bottom during the scene in which Harold and Kumar attend a bottomless party. Tired of the topless party trend, their friend Raza decides to host a rave that he is convinced is the most innovative idea since Jello shots. His dress code requires that everyone in attendance must wear nothing from the waist down. Plenty of gratuitous nudity ensues. We could possibly forgive this one if the scene was gender balanced, but the male gaze is very strong with this one. Despite showing dozens of bottomless women, there's only one man who actually gets exposed from the front. And it's played for laughs, of course. If it wasn't for one particular scene, Swordfish would have been remembered as just another cybercrime thriller from the early 2000s. Instead, Swordfish is remembered as that one weirdly sexual cybercrime thriller from the early 2000s. If Hugh Jackman being pleasured while hacking into the Department of Defense isn't weird enough for you, the movie also features a completely superfluous scene of Halle Berry sunbathing topless. Director Dominic Senna allegedly put a little extra cash in Berry's paycheck in exchange for flashing her breasts. Senna claimed that Barry was reluctant at first to go nude until he offered her a $500,000 bonus for it. Of course, Barry insisted in a later interview that Senna was just being flippant when he said that. Instead, she claimed that she agreed to strip down for the role not because of money, but because she finally felt confident enough to film a nude scene for the first time in her career. She told Entertainment Weekly, With the success of my Dorothy Dandridge project and the critical acclaim that brought me, I finally felt that I didn't have to prove myself anymore. Regardless of how much Barry was paid to show off, her nudity doesn't serve much of a purpose other than getting teenage boys excited. Ah. This looks friendly. As far as Spring Break movies are concerned, the only thing you're more likely to see than a man chugging beer is a woman with her top off. Piranha 3D is no exception, but it takes things a step further by having those topless women get mauled to death by a school of carnivorous fish. Piranha 3D is a 2010 remake of the original Piranha from 1978, which itself is a B-movie ripoff of Jaws. A Piranha remake with a much bigger budget was a reasonable idea at first, but the inclusion of countless three-dimensional breasts pretty much ensured that it would never be much more than a cinematic novelty. Some of the sequences in Piranha 3D come across as straight-up pornographic, which makes sense considering that several of the main characters are hard at work making an adult film of their own. Some of the most gratuitous moments in the movie involve these characters, like the overly long scene in which two models wearing nothing but flippers swim around to classical music. Leaning into the sexy angle seemed to work financially for Piranha 3D, as it earned $83 million on a $24 million budget, and got a sequel called Piranha 3 Double D. Still, it's definitely a movie that would have been better if it was focused less on human skin and more on the blood and guts under it. Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah is a beautifully heartbreaking piece of music. It's been used to great effect in movies of all genres, from dark dramas like Lord of War to family films like Shrek. Zack Snyder understood this when he decided to put the song in his 2009 adaptation of Watchmen, but he didn't seem to realize that the song isn't exactly sexy. As far as sex scenes go, the one in Watchmen isn't terrible. If you hit the mute button, Night Owl and Silk Spectre rescue some people from a burning building, and they're so intoxicated by the thrill of becoming superheroes again that they hook up right there in the owl ship. World War III could start tomorrow. Right. It's a moment more or less lifted from the comics, but what the comics don't have is a soundtrack. It's hard to say what a good song choice would be for this particular moment, but Hallelujah is definitely not the ideal pick. It's a tortured meditation on the destructive nature of love, not something that you'd put on a sexy playlist. Even if you ignore the bizarre needle drop, there are still a couple issues. Patrick Wilson and Malin Ackerman find themselves in some pretty twisted poses inside the cramped airship, and the conveniently timed jet of flame right at the climactic moment is pretty laughable. Who watches The Watchmen? We have, but this makes us wish we hadn't. Plenty of men say they want a woman who's adventurous in the bedroom, but a lot of them would get scared if their partner ended up being kinkier than they are. That's what happens to Vince Vaughn's character in Wedding Crashers, as he ends up in a compromising position with his girlfriend Gloria, played by Isla Fisher. 
In the middle of the night, Jeremy awakens to a pair of nipples in his face. He discovers that Gloria has tied him to his bed and then climbed on top of him, because she's afraid that Jeremy will lose interest in her if she's not more exciting and adventurous. Their dialogue is funny, but the nudity is definitely unnecessary. No one feels this more strongly than Isla Fisher herself, who told the film's producers that it would be a bad idea to show her character naked. Fisher argued that the moment her character shows too much skin, the audience will see her as eye candy instead of comic relief. Alas, Fisher lost the battle for the comedic integrity of her character, and the nude scene made the final cut. To compensate for her sexualization, she decided to dial up her performance to an 11. She told Entertainment Weekly, I thought, to combat the fact that you're going to see her boobs, I have to make her even more extreme for us to still get a laugh. God, don't ever leave me. Ever. Good. Because I'd find you. <laughs> 16 Candles is one of the most inappropriate PG movies of all time. This high school coming of age story is aimed at the teenage demographic, even though it contains plenty of sexual content that would be decidedly R-rated nowadays. While the movie is centered around a compelling female protagonist, there is at least one scene that very much comes across as directed by a man, John Hughes specifically. In the girls' locker room, Samantha Baker admires the body of her popular classmate Caroline as she showers clearly feeling like her own body can never compare. This would have been a decent introspective moment if the movie didn't linger far too long on Caroline's bare breasts. In fact, the script contains stage directions that read, and this is true, close up, the world's most perfect breasts. So much for character development, it's pretty clear this moment was included to please horny teenage boys, and the movie's themes of positive body image get lost somewhere in the steam. Surely there was another way to convey that Samantha feels that she isn't in the same league as Caroline. One that didn't involve the bare breasts of a teenage character. With a title like Howard the Duck, it seems at first glance that Willard Hike's 1986 film about an anthropomorphic waterfowl might be suitable for kids. However, parents who brought their little ones to see it in theaters found themselves covering their children's eyes when they saw not one, but two naked ducks in the first few minutes. The opening credits haven't even finished by the time Howard reclines in his armchair and opens a copy of Play Duck magazine which features a topless duck modeling some lingerie. Then, once Howard and his armchair are sucked into a wormhole, he zooms past another duck in the bathtub with her feathered breasts clearly visible. The camera lingers on this naked background character even after Howard is gone. Throw in a commercial for Jock Itch and Howard's girlfriend telling him about her erotic dream, and the opening sequence is oozing with sex. That's probably not something they were expecting to see in a George Lucas-produced adaptation of a comic about a talking duck. Even though Howard has made a cameo in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, it's pretty unlikely that we'll be seeing any birds with breasts in the next Avengers movie. The Room is a bad movie. In fact, you might even consider it the worst movie. Tommy Wiseau's absurd melodrama breaks every single rule of filmmaking. But there's a reason why midnight showings of the awful flick still attract sold-out crowds of enthusiastic spoon throwers. It's bad in an incredibly entertaining way, except for the sex scenes. Those are just regular bad. In The Room, main character Johnny is a good man beloved by all, except his girlfriend Lisa, who decides to break his heart by cheating on him with his best friend. So, how does the movie show how much Johnny cares about Lisa? By subjecting viewers to one of the most embarrassing sex scenes ever to make it to the screen. The sequence is indulgently long and shot more like a softcore porno than an actual piece of cinema. The sex lasts exactly as long as the song playing in the background, as if it never occurred to Wiseau to time skip a bit or cut the song short. Considering that Wiseau wrote, directed, produced, and starred in the room all at once, it's possible that he was just looking for an excuse to get freaky on camera. If that's really what Wiseau wanted, he's certainly gotten his wish. Millions of people around the world have seen him show off his bare butt. Did you like last night? Yes, I did. <laughs> One nude scene from Last Tango in Paris is shocking not because of the scene itself, but because of what happened during its production. In the notorious moment, Marlon Brando's Paul uses a stick of butter as a lubricant when he assaults Maria Schneider's Jean. Schneider knew she would be filming a scene in which her character was being assaulted, but director Bernardo Bertolucci omitted one crucial detail, that Marlon Brando would be smearing butter all over her body. Bertolucci sprang it on Schneider because he wanted to use her real reaction in the final film. Schneider told the Daily Mail, They only told me about it before we had to film the scene, and I was so angry. To add insult to injury, Bertolucci told The Guardian that he felt Schneider was just inexperienced. As he put it, she was a 19-year-old who had never acted before. Maybe, sometimes in the movie, I didn't tell her what was going on because I knew her acting would be better. After Last Tango in Paris, Schneider became overwhelmed by fame and her career was never the same. The media soon became less concerned with her acting and more interested in finding scandals in her personal life. If you or anyone you know has been a victim of sexual assault, help is available. Visit the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network website or contact Rain's National Helpline at 1-800-656-HOPE-4673.